Hi. This is Gold Fever. We're continuing in part two. Carl Nolte, writer. Where we left off is here. Um, in San Francisco, the rainy weather of 1848, they heard the tales and laughed. Sutter, who owned the land, or thought he did, wanted to keep the discovery um, quite quiet until he could get title to the land, which he had purchased for, from the local Indians for $150. He wanted the title recorded, but the American military gover colonel, governor, excuse me, Colonel Richard Mason wanted no part of it. Um, there would be no land deal with Indians, he said. The Americans recognized no Indian claims to California land. Sutter was in a difficult situation. Gold had been found on land he was working but did not own. His crews were picking up nuggets on their lunch breaks and after work. Soon they stopped working for him and went into the gold business. Why built sawmills when the fortune was fortune was lying around. Sutter was haunted by the idea of gold and of the thousands who would come to take his land. He saw the curse on him, wrote historian Hubert Howe Bancroft. Um, at first the secret was safe. One of the two San Francisco newspapers sent a man to Sacramento in the foothills to see about the gold. On the river banks there was only one house, a hut for the Indian ferryman, Edward Kemple. Oh, oh excuse me. And Edward Kemple, the reporter, liked the climate but concluded that reports of gold were a sham. But there was one man in Sacramento who knew the truth. He was Samuel Brennan, an elder in the Mormon church, who knew that the workers at Sutter's Mid Mill had really found. Oh, um, Brennan laid in a large supply of tools for digging, picking, and shovels and then went to San Francisco to start the rush for gold. Um, he rode up and down Montgomery Street, waving a full bottle, bottle full of gold and shouting, Gold! Gold from the American River! He touched off a rush as he had intended. The prospectors flooded through Sacramento and into the gold country. They b bought out Brennan's stock of mining tools. He became California's first millionaire. <laughs> Selling tools. So, this letter sheet was illustrated <clears throat> was illustrated stationary sold to miners for writing personal correspondence. Tom was not kind to James Marshall after Gold's discovery pictured here late in his life. He unsuccessfully petitioned the legislature for assistance to earn a living. Marshall was forced to sell autographed postcards for a dollar apiece. What is it? James. James Marshall. So, anyway, um, this classic Lewis box crushed ore went in the top and water was run through it. The rocker has been viewed as uniquely an American invention but is in fact descended from Mexican gold panning technology brought to California and adapted by Americans. Anything was possible. Small boats that sold for $50 in the winter went for 500 and were sailed up the Sacramento River. By June, the San, Francis San Francisco was abandoned. Three quarters of the men said Bancroft had gone to the mines. It was as if an epidemic had swept the little town. The streets were empty, as if it were always 
early morning there. It was an epidemic in Monterey, an, in Monterey, an army agent named James Carson had a very violent attack of gold fever. Armed with a wash hand basin, first fire shovel, and a rifle, he was on his way to Sacramento and the gold fields beyond at high pressure mule speed. This little scratch upon the earth to make a Blackwoods mill race Backwoods mill race touched the cerebral nerve that quickened humanity and sent a thrill through the system, Bancroft wrote. It tingled the ear and the finger ends. It buzzed about the brain and tickled the stomach. It warmed the blood and swelled the heart. It was the stuff of dreams, castles, Bancroft said, were built in the air. Mm. There seemed to be gold everywhere in the foothills from the northern Sierra. To the south, so much gold was there it could be dug up with spoons, stored in bottles, gambled away, wasted. There was gold for everyone. By July of 1848, there were 4,000 men, men in the gold country, digging and panning the rivers and creeks. Word spread like ripples from a rock dropped in a pond. Pa parties came from Los Angeles and then Oregon, from Mexico, from Hawaii. By summer, rumors had reached the east, and reports were published in the Baltimore and New York press. People were skeptical, another tall tale from the west. By December, President James K. Polk sent a message to Congress that said large quantities of gold had been found in California. Enough, he said, had to, he said, to pay for the late war in Mexico, which had brought California under American rule. George Cooper came to Sacramento as an illustrator in Judith's view of Sacramento in August 1840 or September of 1849. This lithograph produced throughout the world is without question um, the most important depiction of Sacramento. This image is what sold the world on California's gold rush. By 1850, steamboats were common on the run between San Francisco and Sacramento. They could make the trip in one day versus the nine or ten days it took by the wind sail. The uh, Chrysopolis, uniquely designed for the busy Sacramento River, set a speed record by making the trip in six hours, not equal to this day by a large passenger vessel. And a small scale used for weighing gold. Gold is always heavier than base metal, and the scale measured how much gold the miner might have. Um, many had opposed the war, including Illinois Congressman Abraham Lincoln. Mm, but now, um, Polk said California was full of treasure. The rush was on. As Bancroft described it, the trader closed his ledger to depart, and so the toiling farmer, the briefless lawyer, the starving student, the quack, the idler, the harlot, the gambler, the hand-pecked husband, the disgraced, with many earnest, enterprising, honest men and devoted women. Those and others turned their faces westward, resolved to stake all upon a cast, their swift thoughts like the arrow of Achilles, taking fire as they flew. The word spread at the turn of the year. This was a perfect timing, for the world was in ferment. 
In 1848, there had been revolutions in France, Germany, Austria, and Hungary. The revolts had been crushed, and the rebels were ready to dream dreams of a country where the land was free and there was gold. In China, there was a famine, and thousands of men there had the same dream. There were two ways to get to California, by sea or by land. But in the imagination of the day, some went by rocket ship or by airship. Real travelers would have to wait a century to do the same thing. When the steamer California sailed from New York for California in the fall of 1848, there were no passengers for San Francisco, but by the time the ship rounded Cape Horn and reached Peru, word, word of gold was everywhere. As the ship arrived in Panama, a crowd of gold seekers waited on the beach, willing to pay any price to be taken to California. The skipper allowed more than 300 abroad, aboard. Uh, con considering uh, there were berths for only 60, the scene must have been chaotic. Most of the passengers were hardly saints. Captain Cleveland Forbes thought a good many of them were the scum of creation, blacklegs, gamblers, thieves, runners, and drunkards. They started fires, stole from each other, and fought. The Stokehold crew mutiny, and at least one passenger claimed the officers and seamen were so incompetent so as to make the situation unsafe, dangerous, and sometimes critical. The engineers ran out of fuel, so they had to put in at Monterey and send a party ashore to chop down trees. Later, they burned some of the ship's furniture. When the California steamed into the Golden Gate, on February 28, 1849, flags and sirens greeted her. She was the first steamer ever to make it to California on her own power, and her arrival was the official beginning of the gold rush. It had um, been an epic voyage, 18,000 miles around South America. The crew, of course, uh, immediately jumped ship. Only the captain and the third assistant engineer stayed on board. It says airline through by daylight passage fifty dollars. Um, provide. Oh, oh dear, oh dear. My hair has the wind blows. <laughs> Hold on there, I've paid my passage and I ain't aboard. Bill, I'm afraid we can't we can't get aboard. I'm bound to go anyhow. Passage for twenty five dollars and found this one. Meanwhile, in uh, New York, Boston, and every port in the, on the East Coast, hundreds of ships, some seaworthy, some not, made ready to sail to California. Preparations were at once commenced to cross the sea to go to California, the New York Herald reported. There was general ignorance in the community as to the whereabouts of this new region. Geography has never been a favorite study with the democracy. Papers were full of advertisements for new and fast um, clipper ships, swift steamers, and elegant vessels of every description. The reality was quite different. You had two choices. Sail the Panama, cross the treacherous isthmus by canoe and mule, then head up the west coast. If it were... <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
impossible to find a ship. <clears throat> Cape Horn, known as Cape Stiff by sailors, um, or you could travel around Cape Horn, the worst sea trip in the world, was dangerous and often deadly. The latter route took three months at least, often much longer. Uh, so, above, made in China for the California trade, Chests like this were used by the old Spanish and Mexican families to store religious vestments, lay silk, or other finery. So romantic and so exciting was the image of the California gold rush that illustrators, unable to come to California, fabricated what the event must have looked like or must be like. Many of their vis visions became the er early myth of the gold rush. California and the gold diggings. Life on the Sacramento. A bunch of boats on, on the land, um, on the coast. And the horses, digging, tools, shanties. George Dornan, the, the 19, 19, wrote of first sighting San Francisco Bay from the sailing ship Panama in the summer of 1849. We passed rapidly eastward though the gold, through the gold gate as we entered. The fog entirely lifted. And the sun shone out brightly, giving us a cheering welcome. They followed a British ship with its flag flying and its band playing into the harbor. We passed up the channel, rounded Clark's Point, and above about 6 o'clock on the 8th day of August, 1849, cast anchor opposite the cove on the slopes of which were located the tents and shanties and then constituting the infant city of San Francisco. Uh, it says, when the Chinese came to California, they brought with them the symbols of the land they left behind. Um, the cues, or long pigtails of hair, show their subjection to the Manchu Emperor the government they left behind in China. Thousands of Chinese came to California during the gold rush. This man wore the long queue common among 19th century subjects of the Chinese emperor. Dornan remembered his first day in California. Of Californian news, I can only remember how I drank it in, open-mouthed for all that they said, so much of which sounded like romance. My head whirled, and my brain tired in the effort to grasp it all. There was no sleep for me. The sea travelers went ashore in San Francisco, some wearing daggers and carrying guns ready for the gold country. Their first stop was the waterfront, the road to El Dorado, to golden riches, led through Sacramento. Um, they, Mayor Taylor, a New York newspaper reported, who had been sent west to write about the amazing migration of 1849, left San Francisco for Sacramento City just at the summer, as the summer was turning to fall. He took the schooner James L. Day. The fare was $124 in today's money. Dinner was extra. As the tiny town at the tiny town of New York of the Pacific, uh, he transferred to uh, a river steamer for the ride up the, Sac the Sacramento River. A beautiful stream, he thought, much like the Delaware River.
California, the past history, its present position, its future prospects. Seen on a branch of the Sacramento. The Sacramento. In less than 25 years, uh, Sacramento began to fill in the street grid established in 1849, as illustrated in this bird's eye view, drawn by Augustus Cook in 1870. Development clustered between the Sacramento River and the state capital. At Sacramento City, there was a forest of masts next to a real forest on the river bank. The aspect of the place was decidedly more novel and picturesque than any of any other town in the country, he wrote. And that there was a forest of masts next to a real forest on the river bank. The aspect of the place was decidedly more novel and picturesque than that of any other town in the country. Um, there were one that ten thousand people in the city living in houses of wood, of canvas, and tents on the ground. Uh, the previous April, there were just four houses in the place. Can the world match a growth like this? The town had been laid out by John G. Sutter Jr., the son of the founder of Sutter's Fort, and by Sam Brennan. They employed William H. Warner and laid out a city of 900 blocks. There were 26 east-west streets laid out in letters of the alphabet and 31 north-south streets laid out in numbers. They sold lots for 200 to $500. By the fall of 1849, uh, the lots were going for 10 times the price. Um, lots were, uh, the value of real estate in Sacramento City is only exceeded by that of San Francisco. Taylor wrote, rents were on a scale equally enormous. Statistics convey no idea of the marvelous state of things in this place. It was difficult enough for those who saw to believe. But the new city was no paradise. In summer, the place is a furnace, said Taylor. In winter, little better than a swamp. And the influx of immigrants and discouraged miners generally exceeds the demand for labor. A healthy, sensible, wide-awake man cannot fail to prosper. In Sacramento, as in no other place in 1849, travelers by sea and the people who And the people who came overland by wagon train met. The road to Sutter's Fort, the main streets, and the levee fronting on the Empergadero were constantly thronged with teams of immigrants coming in from the mountains, said Taylor. Such worn whether being individuals, I have never before imagined. The people who came overland were the pioneers of all the legends, and some said they were better, stronger, and more noble than those who came by sea. <clears throat> they came, said Bancroft, from small towns, villages of the interior, honest, industrious, and self-reliant. No one who lacked these qualities could make it, apparently because... To become by land, one had to walk across nearly unknown country to California. Mm -hmm. 
A miner was lucky if he found a few grains of gold after a full day of work. In um, the early years of the gold rush, the ratio was 12 to 15 men to one woman in California. Miners were indeed fortunate to have a woman on the scene. This rare daguerreotype is believed to be a view from Auburn Ravine. How is it 12 to 15 to 1? The overland pioneers who hailed mostly from the south and midwest also thought of themselves as high-minded men and women. Midwest. John Hiddle, who delivered the oration on California's Admission Day ceremony celebration in 1869, saw the vast numbers of travelers to California who were poised on the Missouri River frontier in the spring of 1849 as the flower of the West, nearly all young, active, healthy, well-educated, and all full of hope and enthusiasm. Delivering the Oration California the Mission Day. Immigrants to California brought their own treasures to the land of gold. This one is a steamer trunk brought around Cape Horn, filled with dolls and pictures of loved ones. Knife and a doll picture, a plate, paper, some papers. Um, this is a percussion rifle and a knife from 1850. Um, it all went on. In our ignorance of the nature. Of our fierce deposits, we expected to strike places where we should dig up to 200 to 300 pounds of gold a day without difficulty. In visions by day and in dreams by night, we saw ourselves in possession of treasures more splendid than those that dazzled the eyes of Aladdin. We compared ourselves to the Argonauts, so to the army of Alexander starting to conquer Persia, to the Crusaders. <clears throat> Another said the travelers west, the pioneers, began a journey across the land of which they knew little to work a trade of which they knew nothing. <clears throat> In 1849, the first big year of the gold rush, these 25,000 people, mostly men, went overland to California. Some put the numbers high as 45,000. Nearly all of them traveled by wagon, though some took pack animals. They carried supplied supplies for a year, along with all kinds of possessions. Pianos, mining tools, ovens, bottles, furniture. To survive the journey, most of it was thrown away on the trail. Legend has it, the wagon trains were attacked on their westward journey by fierce plain Indians. But the real enemy during the gold rush was disease. Thousands of pioneers died on the way, most from a particularly vicious form of cholera that followed them across the Missouri River and into the West. The trail to California led along the Platte River, a broad and muddy stream. a mile wide and a foot deep, as the saying went, uh, up into the sand hill country of Nebraska where the Midwest ended and the West began. 
past the strange courthouse and chimney rocks into Wyoming. The travelers wrote their names on the cliffs and on the noted Independence Rock on the banks of the Sweetwater River in Wyoming, where their words and the ruts of their wagon wheels can be seen even today. They crossed the Continental Divide at South Pass and unknowingly walked right by land rich in gold and silver. They went down the western slope past the beautiful Wind River Mountains, stopping at Fort Hall, the last building for a thousand miles. They then moved west and west, following the setting sun like the old man in the Steinbeck story, the leader of the people. Uh, westering and westering. Here shown the individual miner come to make his fortune and go it was a myth from the start. From early on, there was the need to band together. The long tom seen here vastly increased the productivity of the miner. Um, it required a minimum of two or more to operate it successfully. They moved down the Brown and on uh, Drury Humboldt River in Nevada, um, the three hundred miles and a cloud of dust. They wrote some followed the advice of Peter Lassen, another California pioneer, and took a shortcut that led only to fierce desert. They cursed his name. Oh wow. <laughs> another um <laughs> another party um party coming from the southwest entered an even harsher desert and nearly lost everything when they left the poison that poisoned land one looked back and called out goodbye dust valley giving the place its name The rest crossed the Sierra just before the snows and caught sight of California. I thought it was the grandest scene I ever saw, said P.F. Castleman. Uh, weeks later, Castleman arrived at the actual gold digging. We traveled until after dark when we came to the encampments at Long's Bar. It reminded me of a city when illuminated to its height. As we passed through Raven, ravine. Both sides seemed literally covered with tents. All had large fires near them, which made it seem almost as light as day, and all seemed to be life and glee as a thousand voices seemed to mingle together, some talking, laughing, and singing. These, with roaring of waters, as they dashed over the stony beds, and against the rock-bound shores of the river seemed wild and romantic. This is the wooden ox yoke was used to pull wagons over land to reach California. By 1849, Sacramento rapidly became more than just a destination for the gold rush. It became the se seasonal point of departure for mule trains and small wagons traveling day and night for the gold field. Um, they founded dozens of towns and camps with names like Timbuktu, You Bet, Coyote Hill, and North San Juan. Negro Bar, Kino, and Jimmy Brown, Brass Wire, Whiskey, Brandy, Jackass, Lizard, Virgin Flats, Poor Man's Creek, where a million dollars in gold was found, and Gold Flat, Eureka, Sailor Flat, Ridge Flat, Boston Ravine, and Auburn Ravine, Seco Flat, Excelsior, Poker Flat, and Whiskey Diggins. We had come to dig for gold, said John Hiddle who had compared his 
companions to Argonauts and Crusaders. And nearly all of us who came by land went to mining, though we 